above, you can see the results of the pore pressure meters, or you can see also that the pore pressure is going down a bit at, at the trend line. You can also see some, some spikes in the, in the graph, and the spikes indicate that there was some grouting <coughs> during, the, during the measurements. Uh, so you can see uh, it's going up and down a bit. But the trend line is going down. And that was the input for the, for the calculation. And for the calculation, there are the two upper uh, graphs. You see that for the sliding stability, it's going from 3.5 to 4.6. Well, it should be one or higher, so it, it's, it's very stable. Uh, and so when the reservoir level is going down, the stability is going up as, as expected. Uh, and also for the overturning stability, it's going up from two to two and a half. And it's also uh, s stable. Uh, we also looked at the uh, macro stability inwards. Uh, we looked at two co cross sections. There were cell them one and cell them two. And per cell them, we had two sensors for defining the periodic line. Uh, we have one, about half of the, on the inside and uh, two on the inner rock layer. Uh, well, the height of the reservoir level was defined by sensor on the, on the main dam, uh, the Bala Dam itself. itself. For the macro stability, uh, the input is necessary. What you need, the information you need is the, uh, what kind of soil is in the under, underground and in the dam itself. Uh, you need the parameters, how the, this gives the, the strength of the, of the dam itself. You need also the cross section of the dam, and what's the most important thing, uh, you need the information of the, the, the water pressure in the dam itself. And that was done by the piezometric uh, sensors which were placed. Uh, here you can see the results of the real time stability. Uh, underneath, you see again the, the height of the reservoir level. Uh, in the middle, you can see the results of the sensors which are placed in the, in the cell of them. <coughs> and upwards are the safety factors from the calculations. Uh, so when the sensor is going up, you see that the safety factor is going down. And in one point, you can see here that the sensors at one at a certain time, they're going up. The, the water pressure is going up. And in the right picture, you can see the, in the core is an impermeable layer. And when the, 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 the reservoir level is going up, at a certain time, it goes over the core, the impermeable core. And then you have internal overtopping. Uh, and you can see that perfect in this, uh, in this picture. And we checked this with uh, Mr. Puneet from uh, Karnataka, uh, who was working at Deltara for the time. And he told us that it was exactly as they expected. Uh, so it's good to see that that worked. Um, <coughs> and when the reservoir level is low, you can see <coughs> that the stability is the, is the highest. You have only a small sliding at the top, and it's a stability of 2.5. And when the reservoir level is high, at that point, uh, you have a very low uh, stability, it's 1.5, but you have to meet the criteria of one, so in this case, it's still stable. Uh, we also have some, uh, some satellite data. Uh, we are using uh, INSAR. Um, what's, it's, it's good because um, when uh, the, the cell dams are deteriorating, they, they, they're aging, you will always see some deformation. Well, with this method, with INSAR, you can, <clears throat> every ten, 10 days or two weeks, you get measurements from satellite data, and then you can see on the graph left that at some, some points that, the, um, uh, that there's a decrease of, uh, there's a, no, there's an increase of deformation for some points. And we also uh, discussed it with, uh, with Karnataka, and they said that the points we indicated there was some deformation they, they said, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. So, that's good. Uh, yeah, from the recommendations for the coming uh, two years, uh, we want to re rehabilitate the system as soon as possible. Yeah, so some sensors are not working. We have to look into that. If that's 
we can fix that. Uh, we are also focused on the capacity uh, development in the case of Rotterdam. And uh, if the capacity development goes well, uh, then we take up for a second dam of reservoir. And after two years, we're trying to upscale to more dams and reservoirs uh, in India. So that was uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Franz uh, Wandenberg, for your presentation. Uh, we welcome uh, Sri Sanjay Kundu, our session cha chairman, advisor to Chief Minister Himachal Pradesh on the session. Uh, let me invite our next speaker. The topic is dam uh, dam uh, geophysics, an indispensable tool for dam health checks and dam monitoring. And it's being presented by Mr. Stefano Priano from Italy. Good morning to everybody. My name is Stefano Priano. I'm from Italy, and I will share my slideshow with Dr. Sanjay Rana, who will speak uh, uh, after me. So I'm here just to give you an, a general overview on uh, geophysical methods apply on dams. So let's start, because time is short. So why we should uh, shoot blindfolded when we have uh, um, geophysics that can help us uh, in order to um, see better what there is inside a dam. So this is the first question. This is a funny slide. Uh, there is a guy say, hey, uh, tools are available, use them, don't be scared. Your job is still safe. And they reply, no thanks, we are too busy. But the fact is that maybe they are too scared to, know, to use something that they don't know. This is the point. So Soljo is a company based in north of Italy. Uh, we provide several uh, geophysical methods, not destructive tests, we call, um, like seismic survey, electrical resistivity tomography, GPR, uh, which means the ground penetration radar, uh, and so on. The point is that you don't have to know all these methods, but you should at least uh, ask uh, the support of expert people that can help you to understand which kind of problems uh, uh, is happening, is occurring on a dam. So as I said, um, we have a partner in India, is Parson, um, um, is, a, is a company providing a, a complete dam geophysical solution. They have, uh, uh, they have a highly, highly experienced and trained staff, and they have several offices, not only in India. Um, so we have uh, several years uh, working with them, and uh, we we, com we achieve uh, uh, many success with them, working on them. So let's go in detail, uh, talking about geophysical investigations. Uh, when I talk with people that uh, they don't know nothing about these methods, I do this kind of uh, comparison. So I say that they are like a, a medical test. Uh, we basically throw rays uh, inside, uh, the medical uh, test, they throw rays inside the human body like echography, X-rays, and so on. And we do the same with dams. We basically throw rays through the body dams in order to scan uh, the structure. The rays can be differ uh, different, like uh, seismic rays or uh, electrical uh, rays, let's say. But the, the, the results are uh, more or less the same. We are able to see inside of the structures. I will go more in details in the following slides. So here are some, uh, some examples. The problem, sorry, is just that yeah, usually um, the people uh, limit uh, the, their investigation only on the surface. Then the final results depend strictly on the, on, on the goodness on the inspector. And uh, finally, there are no standards to follow. So these are the three main critics that we highlighted uh, 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 all over our experience. 
So the aims of not the destructive test on dams are identification of damaged areas inside the body dam, first of all, identification of not visible fractures and voids, identification of zone of sea pages, extending uh, the information on a wider area of the dam, then decreasing the number of drillings, and finally this means more information and saving money. So, just to resume everything with a few words. Here I have some examples, uh, but since the time is short, I will uh, go um, pretty fast. These are examples from Italy, an arc dam. I know that in India you don't have, but uh, just to, to show you how we can apply different techniques on different kinds of dams. Here, we basically study the, the contact between the, the rock basement and the dam body, as you, you can see, the different velocity are pretty, pretty um, clear. The green, green colors uh, against the, the red colors. This is another uh, test applied on an arc dam. There is a people uh, on a rope uh, fixing accelerometer sensor in order to uh, detect the, the signals uh, produced on the other side of the dam in the water. And the final result is, uh, is a tomography through all the uh, body of the dam in order to uh, find a weakness area, seepage areas like the green over there. Here are another examples uh, correl uh, correlating different tests, different boroughs. Uh, uh, drilled at the bottom of the dam in order to detect the, the contact between the concrete, the blue, the blue colors, and the, the bedrock at the bottom. Here a tomography, always using uh, sensors on the downstream side of the dam and another transmitter source in the water of the lake in order to scan all the body of the structure. Here, an embankment dam, like you have uh, several in India, so we can do also seismic tests on these kind of structures. And uh, just to, to, to example, here, Tungabara dam, where we work uh, some years ago, the, the final results uh, says that the, 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 the dam was in a very good condition, Basically, and another example is the Chimoni Dam, where we, we perform sev seven sections, cross section a lot the body dam. Uh, some uh, operational phase, people working on downstream side, uh, fixing accelerometers. The final results that are very important because highlighted basically uh, a bigger area of uh, weakness um, uh, in the dam that was not possible to see from just the sea pages on the surface. So I finish my, my, my part. I let uh, Dr. Sanjay uh, uh, continue the, the presentation. This were the section on the spillway. Thank you very much for your attention. A very good morning to all of you. All right, so these were a few examples which Stefano has uh, already shown. Now the point is that this is a very short presentation. I've got two minutes, 26 seconds left, so I won't be going in details of it. The idea is to convey the message that whenever we are talking of health checks, just like human beings, as we age, we go for the regular health checks maybe every one year. Now similarly, in case of dams, there are tools available, geophysical tools, which completely in the non-destructive manner, that is just like doing X-ray or ultrasound, can actually look, side, look inside the dam body and tell us what kind of problems we might be expecting. Now this slide, for example, shows different issues and concerns like cracks, degradation, water leaks, landslides, sinkholes, water leaks, strength, and different type of dams. And on this axis, the various methods which are listed, which are, having, which are proven around the world in hundreds of projects. In fact, in India itself, till date, starting around 23 years back, when I first investigated Kota Barrage, we ourselves have done more than 80 dam investigations. And 
the electrical resistivity imaging, which gives you very quick information in the earthen or masonry ramps of what's happening inside. For example, in this slide, you can see the blue zone is the one which is basically a zone with a lot of water saturation, so this is a problem zone. It's streaming potential, which gives you the flow paths right from the reservoir to the downstream. How the water seepage is actually going within the dam body from one end to the other can be determined using this, which definitely can be used for planning the rehabilitation. We have a comparison of uh, streaming potential and resistivity imaging. So as you can see, around 463 chains, there is a big zone, which is a problem zone. And streaming potential shows that from that zone, there is a seepage taking place. There are three more zones, around 2037, 2562, where there is no seepage. So these zones are fine. So like this, there are various methods. I'll not be going in details of it. Idea is that practically whatever we need to see inside the dam, it is possible to see in a non-destructive manner. So which technique and tool is to be used based on the objective of investigation, the resolution required, depth penetration, physical properties, geometry of dam, and nature of target. And the point is that every dam ideally should have a baseline data as soon as it is completed so that you know what is the health of the dam at the time of completion so that you can keep comparing it later. If it has not been done at that time, the time is now. So practically every major dam should be checked for its health. So I'll straight away come to recommendation because my time is up, that these geophysical investigations must be made an integral component of dam safety inspection programs and procedures. Periodic inspection must be carried out on all large dams to detect problems at early stage. Geophysical investigations must be carried out before designing the rehabilitation program and after the rehabilitation. And these methods have great potential for other applications also, like canal seepage studies, stilling basing, chase, etc. Uh, I was having a discussion in the morning with ICOL president, ICOL general secretaries here. It would be worthwhile if you, uh, ICOL can come up actually with a guideline document uh, detailing all the geophysical methods, and this, this uh, guideline document then can be used by dam owners world over. These are new technologies. Geophysicists are generally not part of dam fraternity, so unfortunately the level of awareness is very, very low worldwide, but the potential is very high to actually see inside the dam and solve multiple problems. And whatever assistance can be given, uh, we are there. Uh, we have uh, a lot of experience around the last 23 years ex uh, of experience with dam, our friends from Italy, they have been working world over with dams. So we are all there to help you with that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ve Thank you very much, Mr. Sanjay. And you are invited to join our technical committee of ICOL to share your experience, of course. Thank you, Mr. Stefano uh, Priano and Dr. Sanjay Rana for uh, your presentations. Ladies and gentlemen, there would be a feedback form which would be distributed right now uh, by our volunteers. We request all of you to kindly take a few minutes to fill up the feedback form and you can leave it on your chair itself. We will collect it from there. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite our next speaker, uh, Mr. Edward Eugene Flint uh, from CPMU uh, Consultant Central Water Commission, India. And the topic of his presentation is Structural Measures and Constraints in Maintaining the Health of Drip Dams. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Glad to see a lot of friends here today. And uh, my discussion is going to be, again, uh, a little short, but uh, its I th impact is that I want people to go away with a feeling that the job is not done. We're still, we're in drip, we made lots of progress, and I want to continue with that progress. When we were, whoops. When we were, started this program five years ago, we looked at over 270 proposals. Out of that, 223 fell through the filter, and we uh, now are uh, being implemented at a good, a good rate. Closure is coming on many of these projects, and it's very interesting what we found as far as detail uh, of the work that's been done on, this, on the, uh, the structural major interventions to uh, repair the health of the dam, and also non-structural uh, non interventions. One thing that we emphasize, we've been emphasizing for five years is best engineering practices. And in this, in the structural measures, what we found on the less common ones were the more, I'll say, the more stringent structural interventions, you know, concrete backing, uh, additional spillways, 
other other things that took time to develop a good set of plans and and uh, and uh, and also find good contractors to bid on the projects and take up the works in a good manner. These were a little bit slow in coming. Some are still ongoing, but uh, many of the high value projects are still in progress. About half of them have been closed. We have 16 months to finish the closure of the rest of them. More common, which is good to see also, uh, I've looked at a few dams in the country, and what we found, you couldn't get to the dam easily. There was inaccessible, you couldn't look at the dam because there was, you couldn't see the dam. When you're on the crest of the road, all you saw are trees, shrubs, bushes. So the whole idea of, of dam safety is uh, somewhere you can't find it. So it was good to see that a lot of effort was made to, I'll say, clean up the works, get it back to standardized uh, bunts. Many 80 dams, 80 embankment dams, were, uh, had to take a lot of work on the downstream slope to bring them back to grade lines and uh, lines and grades design. And uh, the other the other thing is that uh, another big big item was instrumentation and monitoring systems. Over 100 dams have taken this up in their proposals. Uh, is it enough? I'm not sure. Uh, then, and uh, these these instruments should go a long way, though, in helping identify the the pro uh, project uh, health. Uh, another another, I'll say, a difficult one to do is repair the glaciers and the uh, and, uh, energy dissipation arrangements downstream. A lot of problems in dewatering. A lot of problems in having access to the dams to do the work, and and uh, it, it was difficult. And some of the, some successes successes are are seen today. Uh, one of the biggest one is Maneri Dam up in uh, UJVNL that uh, had extensive erosion during a flood event before the project, where five and a half meters of concrete was eroded from boulder damage. So these things can take take part. We fixed it. We're experimenting now and seeing how re how the results are. And uh, it should be a, a really good showstopper later. So what are, what are the constraints that we're dealing with here? And I listed five of them that I, I picked up out over the, over the next, last, uh, last five years. And project management and empowerment, pre-design feasibility studies, and um, contracting and oversight and materials. These have all been, I'll say, hurdles to overcome during the, during the implementation of these projects. And it's been interesting to see how, how the changes have come about over, the, over this time period. And what we've accomplished is amazing, I'll say, from where we started. And it's very important to get this thought through to everybody is that if you can get the willingness of the people to take up this work, Everything, any, anything can be done. This is an example I was talking about. The picture on the left shows the uh, crest of the dam, and the uh, picture on the right is the, as the uh, after the work's been completed. This is um, this deferred maintenance, I'll call it, is critical that to be taken up by everybody. Because how in heck can you monitor the dam if you've got on the left side what is going on here? And this is a very important, critical dam in uh, Chennai. It's a water supply dam. And so with the new constraints that we put in the, in the, um, the taking up of the works, requiring budgetary uh, development of, of taking care of your dam, and this will be in the new O&M manuals that they're producing. And uh, we want the, this to continue for past, to past drip, I'll say. Other, other things uh, we've developed uh, are the preventative maintenance tools and earmark budgets, new material technologies, labor, labor reduced methodologies, automated gates. Only a couple dams have taken up automated gates. And uh, that's still uh, another, another big, I'll say, hurdle to jump by everybody. And uh, 
the best thing that we come up with, I think, are the guidelines and manuals that help direct people go through their work process. And this has been a really good, good forum for doing this kind of work and, and making sure that, that people have the tools necessary to do, take care of their dams. Uh, treatment method, uh, methods, I've seen a lot of them here. Uh, installation of geomembrane has is, is now been taken up. It's another one that's just been awarded. That will be a very interesting project on an 88 meter high dam. And uh, we finished one in Tanjetko down in Tamanadu which, with much success with the seepage levels going from 1,200 uh, liters per minute down to 1.83 meters, meters per minute. Very good, very successful. Targeted grouting to densify, and I'll, I'll refer to the work done at Shimoni Dam to identify the seepage sources and how we attack those problems. Another, a bit, another big uh, finding from the geophysical investigations has been the ability to see where the seepage is coming through, and basically on masonry dams, we found that it's targeted at the construction joints or contraction joints where the defective water stops are broken. So what can we do? We got some environmental and social constraints and with emergency action plans and inundation maps and some other tools that have been developed, things are moving forward and that I think at this conference that we've also received maybe about 30, 35 new emergency action plans from the, from the constituents, from the uh, projects. And these are go a long way, these published uh, emergency action plans go a long way in improving the ability of people to maintain and take care of their projects. So steps of success, I'll say in the order that I like it, is new technologies, improved construction management methods, shorter team-friendly contracts, improved dam safety and, and, and health and safety uh, for everybody and better communication. These tools have been very helpful. And in summary, I'll just make this sweet here because I only got 26 seconds left, is with all these tools that we've provided everybody and, and, the, and the willingness that I've seen at the different 223 dams that are being uh, rehabilitated is that the engineers are learning something that that they've never been exposed to before. I'm talking about at the lowest level engineers, the, the, the beginning engineers, young engineers that are working on these projects. I want them to carry that forward into the future with, and develop their skill, knowledge, and ability to handle a dam project. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edward. Thank you, Mr. Edward Eugene Flint, for your presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite our next speaker now, Mr. Graf Benjamin from CNR Lyon, France. And his topic is Example of Hydrometrological Monitoring and Forecasting Systems Dedicated to Dam Safety and Power Management of CNR Assets. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So my presentation this morning will still be about uh, dam safety, but much more oriented towards the importance of uh, hydrology forecasting uh, in order to operate safely your assets. So yeah, this is the agenda of my presentation. So I will start with a brief presentation of CNR, then uh, we'll focus on uh, dam si uh, Okay, so I think there is, uh, there is, uh, this is not my presentation in fact, this is the presentation of my fellowship who is presenting in the other session. So this is not my presentation, I'm sorry. This is the presentation of my fellowship presenting at the same time but in the seminar hall. So can you change, please? Yes. Operator? Oh, 
maybe can we have change, to change, change the, the room because maybe my friend is having also some problems. So we can call the next speaker in that time. Maybe yeah, yes. I think yeah. Yes. Maybe I so can we check call with, uh, Yes, we can we can call the next speaker. And, and maybe you I check with the And you check. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we can we can ask the next one. Mr. Abinad. Sorry about this inconvenience, and we would uh, shortly begin the presentation with Mr. Graf Benjamin. Uh, let me invite our next speaker for the meantime, Srimati Bina Anand from Central Soil and Materials Research Station, uh, Ministry of Water Resources, River Development, and Ganga Rejuvenation. And her topic is influence of. Uh, Aggressivity of water on the long-term sustainability of hydropower structure, a case study. So, good morning to you all, and thanks to the organizers for providing me this opportunity to talk about my subject. So this is about influence of aggressivity of water on long-term sustainability of hydropower structures. Whenever we talk about aggressive waters, people think about waters containing more and more sulfates and chlorides that attack on concrete and reinforcement. But here is a different case. I'm talking about water devoid of soils and very young structures which are facing this problem. Up till now, we have learned about old structures which need uh, health monitoring and checkups and rehabilitation. Here are the cases which are very young. First, reservoir filling. After the commissioning of three or four years only. So very young structures. And they are facing problems of leaching and soft water attack, we call it. So. How to move it? Green button, arrow, wala. Okay. So, in our country, a lot of projects are coming up or already have been built in Himalayan region. So, their rivers are very young and they have not traveled so much. So, very few soils are there in those. So, we call them soft water. Very few calcium and magnesium soils are there. So, it is a very simple uh, chemical equilibrium type of thing. Whatever is less in water, it wants to attract from others. To maintain a chemical equilibrium, so it extracts, it tries to extract the material from the concrete of the dams. So here I am con uh, talking about three projects, which are very young, very prestigious, and very important for our nation. One is Tehri Dam in Uttarakhand. So you can see the figures, the white deposits. They are the reaction of soft water, reaction products of soft water with concrete. And when we uh, test these um, um, leaching materials in our lab, we found that it is 98 or 99 percent calcite, cal calcium carbonate with calcite mineral. So calcium carbonate or calcium compounds are the main strength giving compounds in concrete. So when it is being removed by any process, uh, it harms concrete in many ways. It shortens, the, it lessens the strength of the concrete as well as it reduces the pH of concrete also. So as we all know that pH of concrete is nearly 12 to 13 in the range of 12 to 13. At that pH only, the uh, hydration products of uh, concrete, uh, cement are stable. When pH is being uh, is bring down to a level of eight to nine by any reaction, by chlorination, by chloride attack, by carbonation attack, or by soft water attack, uh, our stability of our hydration products is at stake. At the same time, 
the stability of uh, our reinforcement, the corrosion process of our reinforcement can also start if the pH of concrete comes to a range of 8 to 9. So it is very dangerous reaction. And one more thing, what people do at uh, this project, first of all, we found that no data is available how much leaching is taking place. Second thing, what another major uh, fault people do either in the name of ignorance or what to say, they scrap the uh, white deposits and throw them away without noting any data, how much leaching is taking place. So at the initial stage, this leaching is somehow quite good for concrete because it seals the pores. But when reaction continues, um, our school level experiment, if we remember, we pass the carbon dioxide in lime water, first it turns milky, and then if we continue for the reaction, it turns white, colorless. So first calcium carbonate is formed, and if we continue with the reaction, calcium bicarbonate is being formed, which is highly soluble. And similar is the case here, because reaction is continuing, so initially when calcium carbonate is being deposited, it is somehow good for concrete, but when reaction is continued, continued, then calcium bicarbonate is being formed and with the flow of water, it is being removed from the reaction site. So this is another project in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, India, Paglihar project. A very young project commissioned only in 2009 and these are the photographs I, am, I have borrowed from the CWC report on dam safety inspection of Baglihar Dam project in 2013. So you can see the condition of the galleries here. You cannot walk in the galleries without an umbrella. That much of seepage is there, that much of leaching is there, and no instrumentation is working, is in working condition in 2013, a project which is commissioned in 2009 only. These are the observations we made in 2017 when after the CWC report, project people invited CSMRS for the investigation. So we um, investigated the project, we visited the site and collected water samples. So here, why I am stressing on water quality? Because people think that more and more salts can harm the concrete, but so water with less salts, very few salts can also uh, damage the concrete in the more dangerous way. This is another project in the state of Himachal Pradesh, Nathwa Jhakri hydroelectric project. This is also a very young project and it is also suffering with the same problem of soft water attack and uh, lots and lots of leaching in the dam, foundation galleries and um, powerhouse area. Both the pro structures are facing the same problem. So now very simple, these are the basic ingredients all of you know, but here I wanted to stress on the very important ingredient which generally people ignore or neglect is the water quality. Water is the very, very important ingredient and it plays a very important role throughout the life cycle, lifespan of concrete from the very initial stage of its making to entire life cycle. So whether it is soft, it is hard, it is um, in excess amount it is being used. So both quality and quantity, they are affecting the concrete. So we should be very careful about while using water, which quality of water we are using. People simply say uh, it is a thumb rule that water which is portable is quite good for construction. Yes, it is good. But only pH is not defining all the parameters, all the characteristics of water. So we should go for detailed analysis of water, whole characteristic of water, and then only we should use it. And while designing our projects, while designing mixed designs, the quality of water should be taken care of very well. So these are very basic questions. What is soft water? I have already told. Why it attacks on concrete? Just to maintain a chemical equilibrium. How it attacks? First, it reacts with 
uh, calcium hydroxide, which is a free uh, uh, in free form in uh, the, during the hydration reactions of cement, and that calcium hydroxide, which is formed during the hydration of cement, is uh, responsible for maintaining the high alkaline medium of concrete. When it is being consumed, the stability of our hydration products, calcium silicate hydrates and other hydrates, is at stake. So we are uh, reducing the life of our concrete if we are not maintaining that level of pH. So these are natural glaciers, rain water, they are soft water. And corrosion due to soft water initiates by dissolving and subsequent leaching of free lime from the concrete. These are the chemical reactions. So everybody is not interested in chemistry. These are the uh, leaching action, how it is taking place. So the presence of free carbon dioxide increases the solubility of calcium hydroxide and calcium hydrates, which in turn increases the formation of calcium carbonate and more and more leaching takes place. So with, due to the leaching reaction, the pH of concrete drops and all types of uh, chemical reactions can happen then because of our strength is at stake, our uh, stability of our uh, hydration products is at stake. And one more thing, uh, in reinforced concrete, a brown layer, thin brown layer on the reinforcement, which we call passive uh, layer, uh, is stable at high pH only. When pH comes down, that passive layer also breaks. And if feasible conditions met, corrosion of reinforcement can also happen in, this con in these conditions. So we uh, examined the water quality by standard procedure methods, and we uh, analyzed the um, leachate materials by chemical uh, methods as well as by XRD methods. So many um, uh, codes and practices we followed for the characterization of water samples, basically, because one simple test cannot define uh, the aggressivity of water. So these are the some results of um, Langerial index value, which we calculated from our data. So we found that majority of the samples for all the three projects fall under very aggressive category. These are the results of chemical analysis or gravimetric analysis of leachate materials and in which we found that about 96 to 91 percent or in these are the results for two samples only uh, because due to paucity of time I have not taken all the results. So this is in the range of 96 percent so it is very very high percentage. These are the XRD analysis of three, one, uh, one each sample from the three projects and it shows the main uh, peak of calcite mineral only. So, so this is the conclusion that deterioration process is the cause of softness of water and porous concrete. Here one more thing I wanted to stress that may, a number of problems we can avoid if we take care of our ingredients well and good construction practices we observe. Because when we, our concrete is not of good quality, we make, we designers make designs and decide whatever amount of water is to be added. But in the field when unskilled laborers are working, they used to use water according to their zone of comfort. They, sometimes they use more water just to, for the, their comfortability and our, at that time our quality control um, measure should be very, very uh, uh, careful in that case. Because with more water when we make concrete, it turns to be a porous concrete. And when it is porous, so many uh, aggressive chemicals, aggressive uh, things can enter because majority of chemical reactions happen in solutions only and not in solid state. 
so if we can make our concrete more uh, less uh, permeable that is the case when we can avoid a number of problems in uh, our structures so and one more thing here i wanted to say as i said by my previous speaker that health monitoring as in these days our central government has uh, done that uh, we have to submit our uh, annual health report also along with our aprs similar should be the case with structures that after commissioning of the project regular monitoring health monitoring not in the case of ndt only but in the in such cases seasonal monitoring of water quality and structures should be there in their uh, uh, health monitoring manual i must say this thing because it is always said that prevention is better than cure so we must avoid the problem rather than to solve the problem thank you thank you very much thank you very much um, mrs bina anand Thank you, Shrimati Binanand, for your presentation. Later on, now I would uh, invite uh, Mr. Graf Benjamin from France for his uh, presentation. Good morning again. Let's see if we have the correct presentation now. Okay. So my presentation will be about uh, monitoring and forecasting dedicated to dam safety, but the hydrometeorological part of it. Yeah, it's just coming, most probably. Okay. So let's start. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So I will. skip this one i will go through the agenda very quickly i will just present the my company cnr and uh, then i will move to the runoff river operation the specificities of runoff river operation why we need monitoring and forecasting and then the benefit we can have uh, uh, of the performance of monitoring and forecasting so my company is um, a hydropower company actually in charge of the development of the Rhone River in France. We have 3,000 megawatt of hydro. I think I, I will focus much more on uh, this one. Here you can see, is it working? Yeah. You can see uh, the Geneva Lake here, Geneva City, and this is the Rhone River in the southeast part of France. Here you can see France and the Rhone River. And along the Rhone River, we have uh, 19 cascades, 19 hydropower uh, stations, with total installed capacity of 3,000 megawatts. We also have uh, 400 kilometers of dikes. We operate 14 wide gauge locks for navigation. And the principle of the the company is to have the integrated vision of the development of the river. from design to uh, to operation and maintenance so in the past we did the design 85 years ago we started the, with the design then the construction and now we operate and maintain our our assets and the principle is to develop at the same time giving the same importance to uh, navigation irrigation and hydropower so we really have multi purpose project and the principle is to use hydropower as a way to uh, maintain our assets and to fund navigation and irrig irrigation so navigation is for free along the ron river thanks to hydropower generation so this is the typical assets we have uh, we we have 19 hydropower station 17 are uh, diverted power station you can see on the left on the screen it was the old ron river course and now we have built a uh, headrest channel a uh, hydropower station navigation lock and the tailrest channel and we use a barrage to direct to divert the flow into the headrest channel of course at the barrage we take care about fish migration and we also take care about environmental flow to make sure there is any time in a flow in the old ron river course and you can see here that we have of course the sorry let go back we have of course the power station we have the lock we have the barrage but we also take care of uh, environmental conditions here with ma uh, the maintenance of oxbows we develop small harbors for leisure activities 
uh, industrial ports, we have pumping station, and we develop other assets like uh, uh, wind farm and solar farms. So, we don't store the water. The principle along the Rhone River is to have only runoff river project, meaning what is flowing in is flowing out. And what is very important for us is the operation. And here on, this, on the right, you have the typical uh, runoff river operation pattern we, we have to, to define and to use. The principle of runoff river operation is when you have major flood event, you have to go back to natural flow conditions. So here the x-axis is flow, the y-axis is the elevation upstream uh, our assets. And you can see in light blue it's natural conditions at the dam site, and the dark blue is the operation pattern. So as long as the flow is below the installed capacity of the power station, we can use the drawdown zone and maximize power generation thanks to the drawdown zone. When we reach the installed capacity of the powerhouse, we can keep the water level upstream at the normal operating level as long as there is no uh, impact of the operation upstream the dam. And once we reach a certain uh, flood event, we have to decrease gradually the, the, the water level upstream in order to go back to natural flow conditions. So for low flows, we can keep the water level at the normal operating level as long as there is no impact upstream. When we reach flood event, we have to decrease the water level and we have to do that gradually in order to avoid any impact downstream uh, by uh, adding flow to the natural flow devon. And then for major flood, we have to go back to natural flow conditions, meaning we have to be transparent. There is no impact of the operation during flood devon. So to do that, of course, we need accurate monitoring and forecasting in order to ensure the dam safety, of course, but also the safety of, uh, of people living both upstream and downstream their assets. Monitoring and forecasting are, of course, very important. And we have experience at CNR because we have developed our own system to do that on the Rhone River and to do that all along the, the cascade from upstream to downstream. So uh, we have a specific organization to deal with uh, monitoring, forecasting regarding dam safety. So we have an open space in our headquarters where we have five teams. One team is in charge of forecasting. Another one is in charge of the, the modeling. It's this one, the, what we call the RON CGPR. Uh, uh, another team is in charge of optimizing the, the flow. And uh, we have the remote control uh, room uh, in our headquarters in order to uh, have remote control of the world cascade from Lyon City. And we also have the front office to sell energy on the market. So the principle is, of course, to have gauging station all along, our, uh, all along the river. In total, we have 200, near, 200 plus gauging station along the Rhone River. And we have uh, actually five IT tools to, to deal with uh, monitoring and forecasting. Uh, on the top, you have what we call the hydrometeorological information system, which is dedicated to um, uh, data collection regarding discharge and rainfall. We have another tool dedicated to rainfall forecasting using uh, the global uh, um, forecasting system of US and also the global ensemble forecasting system of US. We also use uh, the French Metophis uh, forecast. Once we have observation and uh, forecast, uh, rainfall forecasting, then we process discharge forecasting. As soon as we get, have uh, discharge forecasting, we can uh, uh, process uh, generation, power generation forecasting. And uh, while processing power generation forecasting, we also take into account outages and limitations. Um, so, and this is, uh, this is a slide just to show you uh, the importance of forecasting. In, um, you have three years of forecast, 2013, 2014, 2015. The, the line is our mean annual production, which we call it 100%. You can see in dark blue, the forecast we can make, the, the power production we would make without any forecast, meaning 
uh, without any forecast means that what we will produce tomorrow is what we produce today. So we are totally blind and we just consider that there is a constant pattern of power production. And you see the light blue is the added value of monitoring and forecasting. So you can see that depending on the, the mean annual flow, of course 2013 was a wet year for us, 2015 is a more dry year. So you can see that there is less production. However, you can always see that light blue, light blue is from eight to 10% of the mean, uh, power, mean annual power production of CNR. So eight to 10% for us means nearly uh, 1000 gigawatt hours. So on the spot market in Europe, 1000 gigawatt hours is quite a lot of money. So for us, it's very important to do that. And it's also very useful regarding maintenance because as soon as we raise funds thanks to power generation, then it's much more easy to, uh, to maintain our assets, to make sure they're in safe conditions for operation anytime, any flow conditions and also to train our people to make sure that they, are, they have up-to-date skills in order to, to operate and maintain our assets. And then I come to my uh, conclusion. So hydro meteorological monitoring and forecasting system are an opportunity to optimize water resources and water use. Keep in mind that we generate hydropower, or we, of course, but we also deal with navigation and irrigation, and we do many things with one cubic meter of water along the Rhone River. It's very efficient regarding dam safety, uh, dam safety management. Uh, we have to operate 24-7 as, as an operator, so we have to uh, be aware of uh, flow conditions 24-7. And um, we can use this uh, system all along the project phase, from uh, design, of course it's useful to have data for, for the design, a good design of the project. Then during construction, it's very useful to make sure that uh, the construction sites are in good conditions. And then for operation and maintenance, it's also very useful, as I showed you before. The system uh, at the moment is very uh, fast to implement and it's uh, very useful. We have uh, delivered the same system to an operator on the Mekong River to share our experience with them. And the principle here was to remind that of course it's very important and uh, it's possible to share experience between operators in order to improve skills of everyone. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Graf Benjamin. Thank you, Mr. Graf Benjamin, for your presentation. And now I would request our session co-chairman, Sri Sanjay Kundu, Advisor to Chief Minister Himachal Pradesh, for a few words as well as closing remarks. Chairman of the session, Secretary General of ICOL, the Rapporteur, delegates from all over the world. Uh, the session 3A technical session was very interesting. Uh, we had five presentations in all. Four were from uh, foreign nationals and one was Srimati Bina Anand, CSMRS. I used to handle this DIP project in the industry for about two years. And one of the major objectives of DRIP was, and the World Bank involvement was, adopting the global best practices. We realized that in India, we were slightly far behind in terms of dam safety and dam practices, and we need to catch up with the best practices in the world. I think this session demonstrated that we are already catching up and we have so many presentations from foreign nationals and they have showcased their best practices. A lot of these best practices have been followed in India. Another objective was to build the capacity of our Indian national professionals. And a forum like this has done that and presentations like this and also working of these top foreign companies in India in the field of dam safety and dam management has actually built the capacity 
of our dam professionals. So I think uh, DRIP program and the World Bank involvement and the involvement of top nationals, uh, national professionals all over the world have been able to fulfill two objectives of DIP program. Now coming to this session, uh, this session was about dam health monitoring, data acquisition and processing. So the question is, what is India doing about it? I just want to tell you that a lot of work had gone on in preparation of dam safety bill in India. I was also involved, so were many officers of the Central Water Commission and many other professionals. I am very happy to say that this was approved by the Union Cabinet when I was in the Ministry in June and finally it was presented in the Lok Sabha, that is the lower house of the parliament on 12 December 2018. The bill is still under consideration of the parliament. But the question is, has the ministry done enough about dam health monitoring, data acquisition and processing? The answer is yes. We have not actually defined the technologies, but there are three chapters in that law which adequately address these issues. The first is chapter 6. It is, it is functions in relation to dam safety. So what all have you described in that? Surveillance and inspection of dams, monitoring, vulnerability and hazard classification of dams, maintenance of logbooks, record of dam failures and dam incidents, funds for operation and maintenance and repairs for the dams, and technical documentation. So this chapter deals with what we discussed today. Chapter 7 is more detailed. It is about safety, inspections and data collection. So it is about dam safety units in every dam, inspections, instrumentations, hydrometeorological stations, which a lot of the speakers today talked about, and seismological stations, their installation. And chapter 8 is about emergency action plans and disaster management. When we were trying to get this bill approved uh, by the union cabinet, uh, we got a message from the Prime Minister office that Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister wants clarification on two issues. First is, is this bill only about safety of the dam structure or you have covered the upstream catchment area also. We said no, we have covered the upstream catchment area also. The second question was, because this bill was totally new of a kind in India, he, the message to us was, has this bill been shown to the leading experts in the world and also leading experts in India? This bill was discussed during the last international conference in Kerala and a lot of international experts, they said this is a good bill and it is ready to go. And we replied to the PMO that this is a good bill and this is the okay of the best international professionals and national professionals and we have taken care of the upstream catchment area. Uh, we are very happy that the bill was passed by the union cabinet and then finally it is in the parliament for consideration. Now coming to the five technical papers, since I was involved with working of some of them, the first paper was regarding outcome of dam safe project in Karnataka. I have had the occasion to attend a course in Del Terrace. Tom Peters and Franz Vanderberg were my faculty there. Sanjay Giri was also my faculty. So they have done a lot of good work in Karnataka. Uh, they came out with dam safe project basically for operational and monitoring forecasting systems. Uh, the objectives are dam safety, water management, control flood risks and emergency response actions. Uh, they talk, talked about the positive results that they have had. I am very happy that they are working with Karnataka. Karnataka has a large number of dams and they have had very successful experience working with Karnataka. The second presentation was regarding dam geophysics what uh, our Italian colleague and Sanjay said was geophysics need to be incorporated into dam safety. This is a new technique, it is non-invasive and uh, I am very happy that Secretary General Eichold said that he should be part of a technical committee. I see a very strong case for geophysics and dam safety. The third was structural measures and constraints 
in maintaining health of drip dams. That was by a consultant, Edward Flint. He's worked uh, in about 200 dams in India. He's got first-hand experience and he told you uh, what are the problems and what are the issues regarding structural measures and uh, constraints. I'm very happy that initially this program started very slowly. But as in any World Bank program or externally aided project, you follow a S-curve. Initially it was very slow, but now it picked up. And it is one of the best world uh, water programs run by the World Bank. Uh, we thank uh, Edward Flint and his team. They have done tremendous job as consultants to DRIP. And they have been able to raise the capacity of Indian professionals and also help us in manage the contracts. The next was, uh, the last was CNR. Uh, I was very happy and I saw your systems, they are very smart. We keep talking about uh, e-flows in India and fish locks and all that. I found your systems very smart because uh, in India acquiring land for reservoirs has become a problem. Uh, if you are able to generate power, if you are able to take care of e-flows and fish locks and all, and downstream you have pumping stations for providing water to agriculture, I think it is a very smart system and India needs to look into the systems of CNR. Uh, there was a presentation uh, by Srimati Bina Anand, CSMRS. CS, CSMRS is a leading institute for materials and uh, she talked about her influence, uh, about her experience basically in three dams, uh, how water actually causes le leaching and what can be done to ad address it. There is nothing much you can do about water but you can do about concrete. All in all, uh, I wish to thank all the panelists. It was a very, very healthy uh, session and a lot of new ideas, a lot of eye-opening uh, openers and a lot of new technologies. And I am very happy that uh, this session basically demonstrated how India is building its capacity and how we are going towards global best practices. I thank the chair also and the repetitor also and the rest of the delegates for very patient hearing. I also congratulate all the five paper, uh, five uh, professionals who presented their papers. They were excellent. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kundu. Thank you, uh, Sri Sanjay Kundu, our uh, session uh, co-chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank all of you for your very attentive presence. Uh, and we thank all our presenters for their enlightening presentations, very meaningful deliberations. We thank our uh, session chairman, our session co-chairman, and the reporter for uh, conducting this session. As a token of our gratitude, we would like to present mementos, uh, and I would request our session chairman, Mr. Michel D. Vivo, to kindly present the uh, memento to our session co-chairman, Sri Sanjay Kundu. So would you like to come forward and we can have a good photo that way. The reporter of the session, Sri Anil Jain. Our speakers, Mr. Franz von Denberg. Mr. Stefano Priano. <clears throat> Mr. Edward Eugene Flint.
Mr. Graf Benjamin. Ms. Srimati Bina Anand. Thank you, Session Chairman. And now I request uh, Sri S. Masood Hussain, Chairman, Central Water Commission, to kindly present memento to our Session Chairman, Mr. Michel D. Vivo. Thank you, Shri S. Masood Hussain. Ladies and gentlemen, we request all of you once again to um, kindly, uh, uh, I would request our panel to kindly stay for a minute because we are requesting for a group photo and I would also request in the meantime our speakers to kindly join us on the dice for a group photo. Ladies and gentlemen, we have given you a feedback form. We would request all of you to kindly take a few minutes to fill up the feedback form. You can leave it on your seat and we will have it collected from there. Uh, the lunch for the dignitaries, uh, the session chairman, co-chairman, and the speakers have been organized in the banquet hall in the NX building. So uh, yesterday, uh, we apologize for all the inconvenience you all have faced uh, uh, during the lunch hour. So today, we are uh, trying to make it very convenient. We request all the dignitaries, uh, session chairman and session co-chairman and speakers to kindly uh, have their lunch in the banquet hall in the NX uh, building. Our volunteers are outside to guide you. At 12.30, we will have an interaction session with uh, Sri Arjun Ram Meghwal, the Honorable Minister of State, Ministry of Water Resources, River Development, and Ganga Rejuvenation Government of India. So we request all of you to kindly uh, be here at 12.30 for the interaction session with the Honorable MOS. And with this, we conclude the session on the dam health monitoring, data acquisition, and processing. We request uh, all of you to kindly join us for a tea now and uh, kindly be seated by 11 o'clock so that we can start our session in time. So I would request if you can be seated maybe a couple of minutes before 11 so that we can start in time. Thank you so much and enjoy the tea. See you all back at 11 for our next session. Thank you. Thank you. 